As an inner city educator, one of the greatest challenges I have is really to remain inspired and encouraged to do my work. Every single day that I make it to my school, I'm reminded of the lack of resources that we have available. When I look around, oftentimes people see it as a place of hopelessness because in Brownsville, only 32% of children actually graduate high school and only 14% will get a bachelor's degree. The numbers are often stacked against us. So I have to remain encouraged and find the strength to empower my teachers, to empower my scholars, to empower their families. And when you're in a community that deals with a lot of post-traumatic stress disorders, which comes from abandonment, which comes from just the issues of poverty, which just comes from um, children who are losing parents. In one year, I had three children lose mothers or fathers and we immediately had to become the family that sustained them. And I would say we, I speak about all of my teachers, even my secretary, my guidance counselor. It's not a simple position. You would think we're only here called to do education in terms of instruction, but we're actually counselors. We're actually pastors. Um, we're mental health providers. We listen to our children. Uh, we go into our own pockets to provide them for the things that they need. I have children who come in without pencils or pens, paper or backpacks, and yet they're supposed to make it through the school year. So when you think about what we have to endure, it's not easy, but I remain encouraged um, because I know that someone took time out for me. And being born and raised in an inner city community, if you can see that I can make it, then I know my children can as well. In my book, The Bridge to Brilliance, I draw off of an experience of when I took my scholars um, from my first teaching experience across the Brooklyn Bridge. I can't tell you um, how much of an amazing and personal experience that became because I've lived in Brooklyn all my life. And I'm very familiar with the Brooklyn Bridge. I've taken the train over the bridge and I've walked it. Not too many times, but I've, I know what it's like to walk across the bridge. And for the first time, I watched children who are tough on the outside, who defy adults, be so afraid to cross a monstrosity of a structure they were fearful that it was going to fall apart. They didn't understand that on the other side of the bridge was Manhattan and that that was a pathway for what would come next in life. And I just saw it as a metaphor. And so when I opened up my school, I thought about what the name should be. And I thought about the significance and how we're all connected. Because when I had to walk over the bridge with those children who were afraid, we had to lock arms. And I had to remind them that I was there for them and I would never let them fall. So Mothor Bridges Academy, our motto is we're connected to succeed. We speak about being part of the past when you leave Brooklyn. When you hit that bridge, you're part of your present. And when you hit Manhattan, you're going to your future. And that also speaks about the expectations of our scholar as they leave our school. The expectation is that they're gonna go on to high school and that for some of them, not all if they choose, can go to college, but if not, to get a great career, which is why we focus on STEAM, which is science, technology, engineering, arts, and math, because there are so many careers that our scholars can get into, whether it's coding, learning how to blog, robotics, fashion design. We're not saying every child needs to go to college, but what we're saying is that we need to equip them with the skills that's gonna prepare them for what's to come in their future. And because that doesn't often happen in our families, households, I need to make that part of my community conversation with my kids. When I got into teaching, I was a career changer. I used to work in the corporate markets, um, ironically as an account collections representative at Verizon. So I dealt with some of the most irate customers. 
who could care less about what I was saying. They simply wanted their phone on. Um, and then I had my own daughter. And I realized that being in that setting was just not what I was purposed to do in my life. I decided to become a teacher because I wanted to be the very thing that inspired me and reminded me to be great, um, which was an educator who cared. But drawing off of the experience of having worked in the corporate world and dealing with those irate customers, I realized that they weren't always upset with me. That if you took the time to listen to the customer's needs and just made a payment arrangement a little bit simpler, if you were able to extend a day or two, or if you had to just be adamant about when they needed to pay and create discipline in their life, because oftentimes that's also an issue, it is the same expectations that you have in the classroom. It's kind of like giving grace. It's understanding the needs of the children. So if you walk in intimidated, scared, and you allow them to know that you fear their existence, like any creature, because we are all creatures as human beings, we feel that. And those children who are looking for someone to care they're looking for someone to provide discipline, will somehow become defiant. And they're usually like that because they just want you to take hold of them, remind them that they are significant, remind them of their value, especially in communities where they're not reminded of that. I don't know what it's like to wake up without my mother telling me she loves me. But I tell you this, I've had children who've never heard it consistently, who've never had a hug, who've never been told that they are beautiful. Do you know what it's like to watch a child shy away because you tell them that they're awesome and they don't believe it? When you walk into a classroom, it is your stage. You are an actor or actress taking control of that space. And so if you're not in this to put in the hours, if you're not in this to understand the dynamics, not just of the building, or the blocks that surround the school, but to actually walk the community and understand what the needs are, then education really isn't for you, or a disadvantaged community is just not where you should be. My parents aren't from this country. My mom is from Guatemala and my dad is from Honduras. Neither one of them graduated high school or have a formal collegiate background. But they had expectations that I would go to college. They had expectations that I would get a career and be something masterful. However, um, it didn't come without challenges when they were seeking the best public schools for me. Uh, initially, my parents put me in private school and then eventually my dad says she has to figure out how to defend herself and we can't keep her sheltered. So I eventually went to public schools. And while my mother did not understand any of the work that I had to complete, she did know when a teacher cared. So my second grade teacher, Mrs. Paoni, was tough little Italian lady. Um, Mrs. Paoni gave us a lot of work. She never made excuses, even if it was for a weekend, as to why we needed to have two hours worth of work. And she would always say that it builds discipline and that you work hard so that later in life you can play harder. And I appreciated that about Miss Paoni because what she did was set the tone for us at second grade. And it continued on all the way into third, fourth, fifth, sixth grade, and then into high school. My mother was there every step of the way. So I use that example because parents have to show up. You don't have to know the curriculum. You don't have to know every single thing that your child is expected to know. But if you show up into the classrooms and you ask teachers, how can I help my child? What are some extra resources that's available, whether it's at the bookstore, whether it's online, that can help them? And be honest, I really don't understand this. I tell my daughter that all the time. She does calculus with her eyes closed. I can't help her. But one thing I do know is that when I go up to her school and I need to speak to an adult, they're willing to listen. And when they're not, that's when I need to speak to an administrator. Because my belief is, 
as a principal of a school, we have the responsibilities of ensuring that parents are allowed to come into our building through an open door policy and be able to share with us the concerns and we're able to sit down and create a plan of action to best support our families because we're here in service of you. It's not the other way around. So Common Core was intentional on making sure everyone in the United States of America was following the same curriculum. So if you're in fourth grade in New York City and you decide to move to Nevada, Las Vegas, you would learn the same exact thing. But what we didn't anticipate, and I don't think a lot of people in policy thought about, is that it's subject to interpretation. How I teach my scholars and what someone is going to assess them at, and when I say someone, I'm talking about the big businesses, the companies that are making so much money and creating tests that honestly are not allowing our kids to critically think, but actually just creating more stress and reiterating um, scores that says that they're failing. And it's not just impacting the most disadvantaged kids, it's impacting kids across America. All of us who are of a certain age, I wanna say, at some point in time, we developed a love for learning. We developed reading habits, we, de we developed socialization skills. All of that came out of school. And now we have classrooms where all kids do is learn to take a test, a test that has no validity once they get into the boardroom or the operating room. What we need to start focusing on are the actual skills that's needed for the 21st century. And yes, there needs to be benchmarks, but they need to be fair. And when we create policies, I am asking that those who are in that position stay in our classrooms, not just to come in to do a ribbon cutting ceremony, but stay in the classrooms for the entire day. See what a teacher's day is like. Become principal for a day and see what it is that an administrator has to go through. It opens up your mind to seeing why our education system is not thriving and why you have so many people wanting to leave a profession that gave so many of us the opportunity of becoming great individuals and leading the society. As long as we continue to lose great teachers, and great principles, we will be failing a generation. So within all of us, we have the power to make that change and to expect it with our elected officials. So it was January 2015 and I wanted to quit. I had convinced myself that if I take out my MacBook, I could write my letter of resignation and I planned on moving and being a mom. That's all I wanted, to be a mom. But I know I was called to do a greater job, which is to help kids, to advocate on their behalf, to educate generations to come. And I will say this, the one thing that got me through was probably prayer. My mother had asked me to pray that day because I told her I could not go on another moment. And I told her no, I refuse. I was so angry. I was so tired of giving. And I think it was just a conjunction of things. As a woman who is a divorced mom, I never asked to become a single parent. I never asked to become a leader, it just kind of came into the growth of what my career became. But I took it on and I'm overwhelmed by it. And so I guess the best thing that I could say is we all get there. We all start to feel like enough is enough and I can't take another day. I don't want anyone expecting any of anything of me. I don't wanna give another moment or second of my time. Why isn't anyone listening to me? And I felt all those things. And it felt like every wall was closing in on me. And then I finally prayed. 
I actually prayed in this very office. It was Monday, Martin Luther King Day. I was here for a leadership conference. And I couldn't be angry anymore, so I just said to God, I had a conversation. Thank you. Thank you for choosing me. I apologize for being angry. Whatever you want me to do, I'll do it. And it was in that moment, I felt like a weight was lifted off of my shoulders. I really can't explain it. But everything seemed to come together. And ironically, it was that very same night that someone sent me a photo of Vidal, who's my scholar, who was featured on Humans of New York. And it's kind of like, that was God's message to me that the work that I was doing wasn't in vain. And that it had significant implications for others. And I think what I loved about um, being placed in that position was that for once I was being honest about being tired and not wanting to go any further. It's amazing that whether you're in leadership or you're head of the household, people just want you to become this superhero and you're never supposed to take a moment for yourself. It's okay. Take a minute, take a second, take an hour. Walk outside if you need to. Breathe in. Let it out. I love sitting in my car. I love just the silence sometimes. But if you're not good to you, you definitely can't be good to anyone else. For me, leadership is being present and being the example. I could be that principal who hides behind a door and a computer all day, but that will not help anyone. I need to know what's going on in my classrooms. I need to know what my teachers are dealing with. I need to know what my scholars are learning. I need to be informed. That's how I make the best decisions in terms of the type of professional development that we provide our staff, what type of programs my scholars need, what type of resources I'll have to beg for, whatever it takes. If you're not present and you're not there to inspect what you expect, people will do anything because that's human nature. So for me, throughout my book, when you read it, you hear about me, um, what I consider being hard on people. And I, can, I, I say that, I'm not saying it to be proud, I'm saying it because unfortunately, too many children have failed. And there's a lot of excuses that are made as to why they can't do things. But if I see that you haven't taught a child how to specifically get something done, how to actually apply a strategy, you can't blame them. If I see teachers coming in late and then they talk about children coming in late, you haven't modeled the expectations for them. So for me, it's really about what do you expect? If you see a leader who's failing, or you feel that you can't respect that leader, what will you change? What will you decide to do? Are you going to sit there and criticize? Or are you gonna be the person who steps up and shows them how it's done? Because for me, that's my experience. I saw leaders who weren't stepping up. And I saw those who were willing to empower their staff. And I was inspired by that. Thus, I created my own school. And that's the one thing I'm proud of. And my staff will tell you, I love them. I love them hard, but I just want the best for them because we have a responsibility for the children we serve. When I was in high school, it was my junior year. I failed three classes, trigonometry, U.S. history and physics. I had gone from a kid who was averaging 85 or more to literally barely getting a 65. And no one bothered to ask me why. In fact, there was one teacher, the math teacher, who said that I wouldn't go to college. She called my mom and told her it was a waste of time for her to save her money because I simply wouldn't make it to college. On the other hand, there was my U.S. history teacher, Mr. Pearson, 
He was the type of teacher who took his time to tell us his personal life story and interweave it into the history of the world. And after one of my particular classes, I had not turned an assignment and he pulled me back and said, you know, you participate in everything. You actually give great comments whenever I raise a question, but you don't study, you don't do work. What's going on with you? I know you're intelligent. And in that moment, I literally collapsed in his arms and started to cry. It was the first time that anyone had asked me what was wrong. It was that my parents had separated. It happened while I was in middle school. However, I was the type of kid who was brought up in a household that whatever happens in the house stays in the house and you don't share with anyone. And I was just so tired of holding on to this story, trying to seem like everything was perfect and it wasn't. So. That defining moment helped to change my mindset. I ended up going to summer school, but I worked extremely hard and got into college, the college of my choice, which was Wagner College. And because of that, when I was in a position of becoming a teacher, I decided that anytime I see a child in trouble, it's not because they want to sabotage themselves. It's because something has happened to them and someone didn't take the time to listen. Now, does it happen 100% of the time? Absolutely not. Because the reality that there's some children who need support in a different capacity. But regardless of what, if you take the time to listen to decide what's really going on, it can take a conversation that can transform a child's life or finding them the right type of support and resource outside in the community that can help not only them, but their family members. I know that as a principal and a former teacher, you often don't have the time to do it. But just imagine how many lives are saved because of that. Just imagine how many children have become successful. Every single day I get to see one of my former scholars, whether it's from Mott Hall or from previous schools that I've worked at. And they always remind me that the best thing that I ever did was give them a space for them to just share their stories and to just get good advice without judgment. So I say this to you, if you're in a position of being an educator, every child doesn't choose to be disruptive. Every child and their parent doesn't want to embrace failure. What they want is the attention that they haven't been given and they want someone to finally recognize that something needs to be done. It's up to you to just listen. When I came to Brownsville, I didn't choose to lead a school here. I was told that I was gonna open up a school here. And so I could make a decision to turn down the opportunity of a lifetime or to embrace what would become truly my purpose. Brownsville is a community where I will say the most brilliant and resilient individuals live. You can't see it when you first get here. You're probably overwhelmed by the amount of project buildings um, that surrounds the community and the toughness that people pose on the exterior. But once you get here, once you have the time to just sit, listen, observe, there's actually a place where the most beautiful, knowledgeable, loving individuals exist. But they have to get to know you. And so for me, I could not understand how is it that a community that exists in a borough that I love of Brooklyn was so underfunded so neglected and allowed to fail. Who was responsible for that? And when would someone just decide enough is enough? So I could either sit and complain like everyone else or say, I'm gonna open up a school with the idea that I'm also gonna close a prison because I'm tired of seeing the statistics and I'm tired of hearing about how we're failing our children. I also decided that I was going to just 
get people to come in, volunteer their time. So mentoring is something that we all speak about, but the question is, how does that look? And what type of commitment are you expecting of folks who have busy lives themselves? So I thought about my I Matter program for young men, which was purpose to empower boys to engage in dialogues about issues that happen in their communities. I thought about my She Is Me program, in which we would bring all the women from the community and beyond to just have conversations so that our young women could see positive role models as opposed to what they see online and reality shows. Because unfortunately, women of color are seen as sexual objects we're seen as individuals who can't have conversations without yelling at each other and degrading each other. And that was imposed upon us by the media. So we have a responsibility for changing the narrative. And so here at this school, we created these programs, we implemented them. Our I Matter has six series that goes from September all the way to June. And it's not just for my scholars. I actually enlisted schools from throughout Brownsville. So we have 250 to 300 young men who participate in the program. Our She Is Me meets every single Tuesday. And our young women are taught to love themselves. We have girls who don't love themselves. And hurt people tend to hurt people. So until we start having those conversations and helping them to see that they are beautifully made, they are intelligent, who themselves have purpose. We don't get to talk about the changes that we want to make if we're not actually becoming the models and engaging in the process. So what I've done is just said, I'm going to be part of the solution. I stay here long hours because I want to make sure that my scholars are educated beyond the school day. So my days at Mount Hawkins Academy run all the way till six o'clock because that's how long my kids are here. And then my actual work starts until about nine, 10 o'clock at night. There's days that I go home the same time as the custodian. He's here till 11 or 12 o'clock because my commitment is not just to my paycheck. I'm not here for that. I'm here because the rewards are fruitless or I'm here because the rewards are fruitful. You can't ask for anything more than a child saying thank you and telling you that they love you because you've always been there for them. I can't tell you how much of a satisfaction that makes me feel every single time I see one of my scholars. So how do we take criticism and change it into something that becomes a movement? Show up. If you're part of an organization, professional, a church, sorority, fraternity, show up and volunteer. Be committed. Our children need you. There are schools everywhere. And there's not one school who would ever say no. Give back because what you receive is so much greater. One of the things that we don't consider when policies are created is that one size just doesn't fit all. Children who are in disadvantaged communities come with excessive gaps. Now, you think about it. I grew up in a household where books were accessible. My dad read the National Geographic, the New York Times. Um, we had libraries of books in my house. I used to go to the library around the corner. In contrast, in Brownsville, most kids don't have books in their households. The only time they're actually um, exposed is when they come to school, when they start kindergarten. And for some, that's when they start at six years old. The libraries are actually embedded within the housing developments or the projects. And so with the amount of gangs that exist, it's hard for children and their families to cross into different sections because it can mean the, the difference of life or death. That's not often taken into consideration. So when you think about the policies, how are we making sure that education is truly accessible for children? How are we making sure that every school is equipped with the resources that they need? How are we making sure that all of our children and their families 
are going to be on the right road, the trajectory to success. So for me, it was important that my kids learn entrepreneurship. Why? Because the average income mean in this community is $27,000. That's the community at large, but within Van Dyke Housing Projects, it's $11,000. No one can sustain a family on that. So it was very important that my scholars learn how to legally make money, how to take a passion, because children at this age are the most passionate and most creative. Take an idea that becomes a product or a service and create it into something that we need in society. How many people have invented something that's so small that has become a multi-million dollar idea? My kids can do that and I believe that. So for an entire year, they take a course, which is Nefty, and they learn through the Network for Teaching Entrepreneurship how to create their own business plans, how to create their own service of goods, and how to pitch their idea. I didn't even get that when I was in middle school. In addition to that, we offer coding, we offer fashion design, our kids have water robotics, they go through veterinarian science, they do dissections, all of the things that they would probably be exposed to in high school or in college but the reality is that my kids are so far behind that I need to expose them now I need them to get excited about their future I want them to have opportunities that go beyond anything they could ever imagine that needs to be in policies that needs to be what we're putting in every school every child should have that opportunity we're living in the 21st century we're not preparing every child to be a civil servant we need them, but every child should know that they have options. So when we think about what our next steps are, I'm going to ask again. Go to your local school and sit in the classes. See what the curriculum looks like and reflect. What part of this do we need in order for our children to thrive when they get into our boardrooms, our courtrooms, or in the operating room? Because the reality is, sometimes we're just wasting time and energy on things that is just part of a bigger business. And it's not fair. All of our children are failing because of that. Not the, just those who are disadvantaged. It's unfair. And we have the power to make a change. So one of the things that's also missing is the art of discovery. So as a kid growing up, I was a latchkey kid. And my parents were gone probably from 6 in the morning till about my mom would come home about 4 o'clock in the afternoon. So I had plenty of time when I got home or if I was off on that day to literally take apart everything. Take apart the VCR, open up stuff, figure it out and put it back together again. Um, my dad bought me a computer when I was probably 5, I was in 5th grade. And it was a Commodore 64. And back then, that was like the original DOS system, right? So we did coding back then. Our kids don't know that. They're not discovering through the process of just doing and learning. Everything is being told to them. And they have to learn it this way. And if they don't learn it and they, they're not mastering, they're no good. That's not how we learn. We learn as children by just feeling things out and learning to stand and learning that if you touch something hot you don't do it again right that's what we've done as kids and i think about as we transition and go into the education system how prepared are our teachers there's a lot of schools whether it's a college or university that are making money off for the preparation of teachers but have not changed their own curriculum to ensure that our teachers are prepared for what they're going to experience in the classroom. So that includes dealing with the kids who are going to be difficult and challenging, dealing with kids with special needs, dealing with a curriculum that doesn't fit this particular community, but how do you make it accessible? They're learning more about theory and not focused on the practice. And so they graduate with false sense of hope 
And then they come to a school like mine and I have to have a different conversation. So we need to develop relationships with our colleges and universities. Not only to prepare our future educators, but also to create pipelines so that our kids who are in elementary, middle, high school have the opportunity of visiting colleges, know what programs are available, know the type of financial aid they'll receive, know what type of pathways they can take online, brick and mortar. There's just so much that we can do as a community to narrow the scope and kind of close this gap because it exists because we don't develop relationships. And for those corporations that are out there, there's so many. You're making money. You have a community responsibility. I know you want to do good. Show up to those schools who need you. Staff members can volunteer their time and services. You have an extra box of paper. Schools in disadvantaged communities can use that. A wall needs to be painted. Maybe you can come out and help us. Perhaps you have someone who has an engineering background who wouldn't mind sitting with kids and explaining to them their profession and really showing them the art of their profession and then telling them how they got there. Because we all have a journey. There's so much we can do to bridge the gap. If we want to see our kids make it to the 21st century, we want to see that we are successful. Doesn't matter what part of the world. We all need to be part of the process and stop blaming each other. What are you going to do different? That's my question to you.